Hi everyone, it's Artem Mushin Makedonsky here with you today. Uh, storytelling in business again, and uh, I'm proud to present Mike Adams. Mike is, uh, I, I can just say he's a guru of storytelling. An engineer may uh, turn salesperson, turn storyteller, but I guess he'll cover it. Uh, he's an author of uh, the seven stories every salesperson must tell and the establisher of uh, the story leader, which is like a major company in, in storytelling business. Thank you for this for your time, Mike. It's great to have you here. Tatyum, dobry dzień. Thanks for having me. <laughs> great. Um, I know you've you've uh, you've worked in Russia, so it's it's so pleasing to, to hear hear this. You, you have great accent, right? You, you don't have none. No, I don't know about that. I I've forgotten most of my Russian. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but when I was working in Russia, which was the year two thousand to two thousand and two. Uh -huh. There's uh, one Vladimir Putin had just become uh, the um, president just before yeah. we arrived. Um, so then I could speak reasonable Russian and I had a policy of not, I could understand in a business meeting, but I would pretend not to. <laughs> because it was, it was safer that way. <laughs> it, was much, it was safer using a translator and uh, <laughs> that's saved, nice. saved me. That's a good tactic. I'll just bear it in mind. Yeah. So, Mike, uh, I have a set of questions which would be really interesting for the salespeople watching us because yeah. I know you're an expert in sales. And uh, the first one would be like easy. And uh, could you tell me when and how and why uh, did you understand and come to the point that business storytelling is actually a thing and it's valuable? Yeah, well, I, I trained as an engineer. I'm an electrical engineer. And yeah. uh, I had no intention of being a salesperson whatsoever. But uh, when I was living in England, I had this fantastic job out of university. I worked on oil rigs all over the world, Malaysia and China and Indonesia. And then I got transferred to London. And I was working on software for oil and gas software and, uh, as an engineer. And then I got offered this job to transfer to Norway, which I thought fantastic. And then it was to be a salesperson. I was like, no. <laughs> but actually, I said, I can't go. My wife is uh, eight months pregnant, so it's impossible. And then I went home and she said, well, you know, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> she wanted okay. to go to Norway too. So we transferred to Norway and had our second son in Norway. Uh, that was 1996. And I started selling. And I was a really bad salesperson. I was just really lucky my first year. Really? And it sold a really big deal. But it was just luck. Trust me, it was really luck. And... Um, so then I stayed because when you have one good deal and you think you're good. So then I stayed in sales and I, I worked throughout Europe and I, I transferred to Moscow in, I went back to Australia for a little time. I transferred to Moscow in 2000 with Schlumberger. Okay. And yeah. by then, by then actually um, I had already some idea about storytelling. I had noticed I had noticed that certain stories are really persuasive, but my, my concept was not small anecdotes, which is what I teach yeah. now, not two, two, three minute anecdotes. It was more almost like a drama, like a stage production of a story. Uh -huh. And in fact, uh, when I was in Russia, we, we were selling software to the big oil companies in Russia, oil and gas companies. And we had a, a user forum for our software down in Sochi on the Black Sea. So it would have been about 2000, probably early 2002. And, um, and I wrote a play. Uh, we were selling software for, um, which was essentially software that let all the different disciplines in oil and gas subsea analysis, you know, so geologists, geophysicists, let them all work on the same software at the same time. And I wrote a little play which was translated into Russian. And each of my staff, my geologist, my geophysicist, my reservoir engineer, and the manager, they all played parts in this play. And, and I even remember I had something about Vladimir Putin and his dog in, in this play. <laughs> That's all I remember. But That's risky. <laughs> they acted it out. And, let, and let's say the play probably went for about 30 minutes. And we had 400 of our Russian oil and gas customers in a big theater. And then they started asking questions. And the, 
and the the people acting the parts in the play they just stayed in their character and answered the questions and the questions went for more than an hour like you know through the coffee break and everyone was so interested in that play you know so it was obvious to me that that the big story was highly persuasive because we were, we were not saying how great our software is or you know how what the different features and and attributes of the software was we were just demonstrating in a play how you would use it and that was very very persuasive you know but then i tell you it's interesting it also happened to me in russia that i noticed the small story so shlombage I don't know if your audience will know the company, but Shlomoje has quite a long history in Russia. The, the company was founded in the 19th. So I'm on to my second story now, if you're keeping track. Um, yeah, I am. <laughs> okay. The company, um, the company was founded in the late 1920s in Alsace. Alsace is an area between France and Germany. So it gets sort of taken yeah. over by the French and taken over by the Germans. So, so the word, Schlumberger would be the German pronunciation of the Schlumberger name, and it, but but in the oil and gas industry, it's pronounced Schlumberger because Americans, no, American, French, yeah. Americans mm -hmm. can't pronounce anything in French or German, so you know that's, that's how it goes. But anyway, the brothers invented a technique for working where working out where the oil is in an oil well by dropping an electrode down and measuring the resistivity between the electrode and the surface. Really? Well, I know this technology. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's called, it's called well logging. And, and that invention, you know, it, it made a $40 billion company. It's just, just one invention. It's, it's been hugely profitable. But the problem was um, the only country in the world that really understood it when it was first released was, was Russia and the former Soviet countries, particularly yeah, towards yeah. Georgia. And so the Schlumberger brothers set up their business in, in Russia and they were doing very well. They had uh, a Russian manager and uh, lots of, of trucks throughout Georgia and the Southern Republics. And then uh, Stalin uh, nationalized them. So they had oh. all, of, all of their equipment taken and all of their people kicked out. And this is actually a very grim story. So that happened in the early thirties or mid thirties. And, um, you know, if you fast forward to the 1990s when Russia was opening up again to Western oil companies yeah. and Western service companies, Western technology companies, you know, Schlumberger had to make a decision, you know, do we go back into Russia? Because the history wasn't good. Fortunately for them, the business did start going well in Texas and other parts of the world. So the, the company grew very well. But anyway, the, the strategy guys took a business case to the CEO and they said, basically, how much money are you willing to risk? He said $200 million. And they, um, they decided to invest in two of the newly privatized companies, which were um, Yukos and Sivniev. Now, both of those companies, I think, mm. don't exist anymore. But those were two yeah, of the very, very successful early uh, oil companies in the early 2000s. And with the help of, of Western technology, but also people, the Shlomoje put people into quite high positions in those companies. To, to change the, the business culture. And, um, and they doubled their production in 18 months. Wow. And I, I told that story, I, I told that little narrative about the early history of Schlumberger and then going into the, the companies later to some of my other clients. And I, I started hearing the same story coming back from a different client. So I would tell it to this client and then I would hear it back from this other client, right? So oh. that's, that's when you know like the story has some power, right? And, and yeah. the, the reason that story has power is because of how bad the, the bad part of the story is, that the fact that the, the business got thrown out of the country, you know? So yeah. well, it's, it's the roller coaster of how things go bad and then how you get them back that, make, that gives that story its power. So that's an example of a, of, a, of a special purpose company story, which is my story number three in the seven stories. So I've told you a little bit about my personal story, not, not yeah. my full story, which is story number one. And, uh -huh. um, and the company story is, in that case, it's modified for my territory. I told you the story of Schlumberger in Russia. Yeah. And, uh, like, that makes sense. Like, if you're trying to open the business in Russia, then you want to be able to tell the story of your company in that territory, particularly if there's a good yeah. history. But you might also tell... You know, let's say you work for Microsoft. 
you might tell the story of Microsoft Azure, you know, the cloud. You might not tell the whole Microsoft story because it's very long and maybe not yeah. relevant to your client. So you can, if you're working for a big company, you can split it off and tell the story of your territory or your product or whatever. You still might give the early history and then you would change to the, just the, the history of, of this particular product or this, this, this particular territory. So that's a long answer to your question. So back in 2002, it was becoming very obvious to me that stories were very powerful. Of course, it took me a little bit longer to be very purposeful about them. And Seven Stories is a book about teaching you how to be purposeful with your stories, yeah. how to know what stories to listen for, what, which stories to collect and practice, and when to use them where in the sales process. It's a really a framework of what stories work best in the, throughout the sales cycle. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, in your, your cycle, well, first of all, thank you for the question, the, the stories you've told. Uh, it's, it's a great explanation why it, it actually works. Your uh, view on the seven stories, it's like a full cycle and it's, it's it, it, the amazing me metaphor with the fishing. Like, yes. uh, th 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 yeah. it's just, it's great. So, so, so I understand uh, you've had both uh, my friend, Mike Bosworth and uh, Paul yeah, Smith. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Mike talks, talks about three stories and uh, Paul talks about 28 stories and I talk about seven stories. So yeah. So and th th that's basically the question I would like to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mike, Mike, Mike is probably the smarter one of the three of us because it turns out <laughs> to be, you know, not that easy to teach salespeople storytelling and you certainly don't want to start with even seven and certainly not 28 because yeah. um, it's it's a slow process to internalize these story types and to understand when to use what but the idea of seven stories well firstly seven is a number that most people that can remember you know if i ask you to remember seven things you might have a chance and if i ask you to remember yeah. eight you're probably not going to manage it so it's a limit of what can be remembered so that's one reason for seven but what I did with the fishing metaphor is looked at what stories you would tell when you're first meeting a potential buyer, what stories you might tell through the middle when you're trying to change their mind and you're trying to get new concepts and new ideas, trying to get them to understand that. And then what's really difficult, particularly in, in uh, large sales where you're selling to a, a tender committee or a buying team, how do you close the deal? You know, how do you get the deal across the line when you can't even maybe talk to the buying committee yeah. once they close down? You know, the tenders are submitted. Now you don't talk to us, right? So now you only answer our questions. So how do you use storytelling then, which is most difficult? So that was the sequence. And, and the seven stories are three stories to hook to hook your client. So that's the start yeah. of the fishing, right? So you, you make your lure, that's the story, but then you go fishing. And I know that in Russia, you're very fond of your fishing. So this one I'm safe because uh, you guys yeah. fish everywhere. Um, <laughs> so so when you, sure. you hook your client with the stories like your personal story and your key staff story and your company story, and the purpose of these three stories is to show that you're credible, show uh -huh. that you're an authority, that you can be trusted, but also that you're a person like your buyer, you know, you're relatable. And, and yeah. the most important really is the personal story in my opinion, because if you tell your personal story in a relatable way, and if you're not scared to be a bit personal, like I told you my wife was eight months pregnant, well, you might think, why? Yeah. Why would I say that in a business meeting? Well, I say something personal like that in a business meeting because when I deliver my personal story, I will say to them, well, enough about me, what about you? How did you get to become the business manager for this business or whatever? But, you know, in other words, what's your story? And, and our convention is when one person tells a story, the other person tells a story. This is a human convention, actually. And if you put something personal in your story, is a very high chance they put something personal in their story. They will tell you about their wife being pregnant and what happened or, or their sister or, or maybe they know somebody that went to Norway. Or, you know, it doesn't matter what they pick up on, but they'll pick up on something. And this is the connection. This is when you start to be more like friends. 
than just business people, right? Yeah. Um, and this, I think, you know, this is what I know about doing business in Russia, different from the United States. So I've worked in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Norway, in Germany, in France, and China, and in Indonesia, and Malaysia, and all these countries, right? And yeah. I would say that all those com- countries I mentioned are more similar to each other than the United States. The United States <laughs> is more different. Because in the United States, it's like, let's get down to business. Let's get yeah. done with my time. Let's get down to business, right? And less time is taken building trust. And in Russia, we spend a lot of time building trust, a lot. Uh, trust me, I know from the business deal. <laughs> and this is time well spent because once you trust and know the other person, then you can go fast. Yeah. And, and you don't have litigation. You don't go to court. So it's actually pretty unusual to go to court, even in Russia, you know, like I know you have your problems, but actually when I was in Russia for two years, we had no legal cases whatsoever. Uh, We had generally this doesn't happen, right? But it happens very often in the United States. So I think if you don't take the time to know the other person and to get to trust each other, then you have these chances of misunderstanding later on and you get this more litigious legal kind of business relationship. And, and it's much better to have a business relationship where you know the other person personally and you trust them. And this, this is better business. In my opinion, this is better business. Great. Yeah. So, Mike, thank you. Um, I just wanted to go two ways, actually, from yeah. your answer. First one is, I, I love this phrase, enough about me, how about you? This yeah, is like actually pretending, like Mike Bothworth puts it. That's so, right. I, I hear that you tell a story to, to make someone tell a story, but are there any ways, any other ways you could advise to get the story out of someone? You know, uh, sometimes they just tell their story. It does happen occasionally. Uh, but my experience is that, um, yeah, my experience is that when you, let's talk about the first meeting with a buyer, right? The first meeting, yeah, of most course, of, that's of the most important meeting in business, right? Because you're probably not going to get a second meeting if you mess that one up, right? So yeah. this, this one, you might have done a phone call or an email or whatever, and you got the meeting, but now you've got the first meeting and sitting across the table from you is someone you never met, right? Right. Now, so... Generally, what we use is we use half a story to get the meeting. So maybe I'll explain that first, and then we'll talk about it. So the stories four and five in the seven stories book are insight stories and success stories. Yeah. If you've been in business any time at all, you will have had success stories. And you tell that story from the perspective of your successful client, your other client. That's not easy to do. People need to be taught how to do that. And insight story is where you're telling the story about how you discovered something about your client's business or their market that they don't understand, but they should understand it. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the definition of insight. Because, you know, if I tell you something and, and you already know that, is not insight. Yeah. There's a definition of insight is you didn't know that. But yeah. the problem is for salespeople, if I go to my client and say, you don't know this, they're going to push back because they're going to say, you, you're telling me I don't know my business, right? You think, you yeah. know, you're like the 25 year old salesperson and the 50 year old procurement guy, like this doesn't go well at all, right? But if you tell them a story about how your company learned that thing, this is how we discovered it then they listen and they understand. How much time do we have? Can I tell an insight story? Yeah, I guess, yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you an insight story from the, from the medical industry. It's, it's in the book. So this is the yeah. story about actually a master's student, uh, Barry Marshall. So he was studying at the, uh, the Royal Perth Hospital in Western Australia, where I do a lot of business. And back in 1982, and he was looking for a topic for his master's thesis, and he was told to go and talk to some guy who had this crazy idea that stomach ulcers are caused by bacteria. And at the time, people used to think stomach ulcers were caused by stress. So if you went to the doctor, the doctor would say, take two weeks off, right? 
And it kind of yeah. worked because, you know, two weeks off probably solves a lot of problems that are bacterial infections. Right? <laughs> but, um, right. but Marshall and, and Rob and Warren had this idea that it was bacteria, but they couldn't get anyone to listen to them. So they had some insight, but nobody listened, right? And so yeah. Marshall, Mar what Marshall did was he did an endosc endoscopy, a scan of his own stomach, and then he got an infected patient and he got the bacteria and he drank it gave yeah. himself stomach ulcers and then scanned his stomach to prove he had them and then gave himself the antibacteria and cured himself. And when they wrote that paper, people paid attention, right? People noticed that one because that's a pretty impressive story. And Marshall and Warren, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in 2004. Yeah. So this is, a, this is a short story about insight. So they had insight, but they couldn't get it across. They had to teach the medical community and the research community that this works. So they had to kind of teach how you learn this. This is how we learn how that thing will cure stomach ulcers. This is the demonstration, if you like. Yeah. So the story is yeah. the demonstration of how we learn. And of course, that's very interesting. And your client will listen to the story, but they won't listen to you telling them that they're wrong and they don't know their business, right? So when we have the first meeting, we usually don't tell the whole story to get the meeting. We usually yeah. tell half the story. So we will say to the client, we'll ring them up and say, look, we've just performed this experiment. One of our guys actually drank a bacteria of uh, whatever because he thought it would cause stomach ulcers. And I want to come and talk to you about the result. Oh, great. <laughs> and what are you going to no, say? Yeah. You're going to say, shit, I want to know what happened to that guy, right? <laughs> That's so, smart. So you, you create some curiosity. So this is what yeah. I mean by telling half the story. And the same with a success story. If you say, if I ring you up and say, oh, John, I got this client, he's like you, he's in the same business as yours. In fact, he's, he's just a Leninsky prospect. And <laughs> he's, he's got exactly this issue and this issue. And we spent like 18 months to figure out how to solve that. And I want to come and tell you what it's done for him because you wouldn't believe the result now. Great. Is, half, is half a success story, right? And you're going to say, yes, I want to hear about that guy, right? So now this is how you get the meeting. And this is a curiosity play, right? I'm telling half yeah. the story. And then what I would typically do at the start of the meeting is I would say, look, I told you about this client in Leninsky Prospect, and, and I'm going to get to that. But before that, you know, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I got into this game. And I'd also like to know a bit more about your business and you. And then I would give my personal story. And my personal story will be the relevant career story that explains how I get in front of this guy. How did I get oh. to be the salesperson in front of you, right? Yeah. Because this guy has a question and his question is, who the hell is Mike? You know, who is that guy sitting in front of me? Can I trust him, you know? So yeah. I tell that little personal story in a couple of minutes. So it's a little career story, but I'm, tr I'm only putting in that story what explains how I got here in front of him and why he can trust me. And then I'm going to say, well, enough about me. What about you? How did you get to be in charge of this business or doing whatever they do, right? And then we exchange the stories. And then I'm probably either going to go in and tell the full insight story or the success story with all the details. Or I'm going to ask them some more questions about their business because the more I know about their situation and their business, the better I can direct the story to be exactly relevant to their situation. So I might say, let's say we're selling software and I might say, well, you know, how many engineers do you have in your business, you know, that might use my software? And are you using this type of uh, software at the moment or this other type? I'm asking kind of easy questions. And I'm getting in yeah. to understand about their business. So I'm going to use the combination of questions and stories to get in to understand, you know. And I'm not going to propose any solution whatsoever until I'm pretty sure that I have a good solution to their situation. But we're using the story to open up, to hear their story, and then to hear how things are in their business so we can tell some more stories and tell them, ask some more questions and tell them some more things. So really the, the tools of a salesperson are questions and stories. 
I wrote a book about storytelling, but there are plenty of books. There are plenty of good books on, on questioning skills. And I would say, uh, Chum, that, you know, the sales training is actually, it's too heavy on questioning skills. It's not enough on rapport building and storytelling skills. So yeah. there, are, there are actually a few books on storytelling and way too many on questioning skills. Um, and, you know, here. Uh, you know, I can recommend the classic spin selling. Mike Bosworth wrote one, Solution Selling. They're all great books, but they're only half the story. They're not, they don't give you everything you need because all I can do with a question is direct your mind to think about something in your own experience, right? Yeah. And that's all I can do with a question. I can ask you about something and I can get something about your own experience. But with a story, I can put a new experience in your mind. Sure. If I tell you the story of a client that succeeded with my software, with my technology or whatever I sell, you get that experience like it was you, like you were there. And there's only two ways that we can learn something as humans. Either we do it ourselves and we experience it directly, or yeah. we learn from somebody else from a story. These are the only yeah. two ways that we can learn something. And mostly we actually learn from story. If you think about all the things you know, you learnt it from stories. That's true. So, so what we're doing with storytelling in a sales conversation is we're giving our buyer experiences that will help them understand who we are and how they should use our products and services and how to actually buy them. We're just okay. giving them stories to teach them that. That's true. Thank you. This is an insight for me telling half the stories. This is great. I'm going to use it. I'm going to teach it to people. This is, this is great. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, about about this, the whole story, I, I see that you have like a really in-depth uh, view of how they work and why they work. Just for a moment, let's take a, a small step back because you said that personal stories is like a guideline, how I got to this place and how, why I'm in front of you. And my question would be, uh, post like like this um a guy in australia sean callahan you, you probably know him he I'm, is having, also... I'm having a beer with sean this thursday oh that's i'm so jealous right now really <laughs> sean and well, Mark, we were his talking... business partner. yeah yeah i i have their newsletter and they're, they're, those guys are just brilliant well, they do an they excellent, have a of... excellent uh, podcast as well so you yeah should catch yeah. Podcast. yeah i'm a fan I'm a fan already. So um, my question would be, uh, they, those guys, they have like a set of uh, trump cards and uh, they are openly sh sharing them to develop leadership and stuff. So basically they, they have some questions uh, that uh, story tend people. Like uh, remember a, an episode of your life where you experienced, where you've uh, been a leader, a true leader. And um, th those questions dig out some stories of ours. So my question is, can I use those stories as personal stories or in your opinion is just about uh, a guideline to why I'm here and how, what, what got me here? Yeah. Um, so the personal story by definition, you are, yeah. the central, you are the central character of your personal story. So, sure. so you, you know, Sean and Mark's, you know, 50 questions or whatever it is to help you find stories. Um, yeah, those questions are often about finding other people's stories. They're like how to interview someone to find other people's stories. So yeah. generally for the personal story, you're looking inside yourself for your own experience. The problem, of course, is you can't give your entire career story like you have two minutes or maybe three at the most. Yeah. So what is interesting to the other person is what you have to think about. And generally it's career transitions. So I, my job is to sell. I sell okay storytelling as a service, right? So I teach sales teams how to sell storytelling. So what's interesting in my career about that? Well, firstly, I'm an engineer. So how did I get from engineering to selling? That's one transition that I could talk about. And I told you, you know, about being transferred with my wife eight months pregnant, right? And then how did I, the other part of my experience is it just so happens that I've worked all over the world not just with one company, but with several big corporations like Nokia and Siemens and Halliburton. And yeah. so, so how did 
how did that happen? How did I get to work for so many companies, you know? And then how did I switch? And you asked me, like, how did I get to know about stories? I can tell you, if you change industry and change company five or six times like I've done, you better learn how to tell stories because you have about eight months to learn how to sell something or you lost your job. Um, and it, particularly when you have to change industry, you really need to think about stories because you don't have time to learn that industry. You have to find yeah. the right stories. So that I tell that in my story because that explains why I got into storytelling. And then the last yeah. thing I usually say is, look, in 2014, I, I decided to stop working for big companies and set out on my own because I wanted to see if I could teach salespeople storytelling because I, for me, that had been about the only thing that I could teach my sales guys that they like to hear about and they could, they could improve really quickly. Almost everything else I tried to teach salespeople, they usually went backwards. They usually were worse after I tried to teach them something rather than better. For example, if I tell you, Achum, you should ask this question or this, this question, then this question, then this question, you will go into your next meeting thinking, now, which question am I supposed to ask next? You know, was it that? <laughs> And you'll forget, to, you'll forget to listen to the client, you know, and, you, and you'll probably have a worse meeting. So it's, yeah. it's not easy to teach salespeople anything. And it's particularly hard to teach salespeople something that, that they can get a, a quick improvement. And storytelling is one of those things. And that's why I, I started. So, so you see, I'm, I'm focusing on the transitions. Why did I yeah. go engineer to salesperson? Why did I start storytelling? Why did I start my consulting business? And each of those little mini stories, which is adding up in my personal story, is giving an impression. And the impression I hope should be, this guy probably knows what he's talking about, right? And, Great. you know, Got so it. that's, so, but also I'm not scared to tell you that I had good luck or bad luck or my wife was yeah. pregnant or whatever, you know? So I can, if I put in those things, that I, I we call you know vulnerable things you know that's like I'm, I don't want my story to sound like I'm I'm a genius right because this is not not at all true I had a lot of luck along the way so you want your story because because if your story sounds like this guy is member of Mensa never failed and never had a problem is just a genius the other person is not, like a super they're, story. they're not going to tell you their story right there's no way they're going to yeah. tell you their story because that's intimidating. So we yeah. have to have this personal failure aspect in our story as well. So that's great. a long answer, long answer to that. But, um, but th that's a great answer because, you know, it's just n nice to hear your point of view. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, the next one, the next question will be like more or less technical. Uh, one of your interviews, uh, I, I can't quite remember which one of the, w that was, uh, but you said that there is like, First, you go through agenda, and then you go back to your uh, personal story. And I'm, I got myself thinking that, hmm, for example, I get the agenda, and then the salesperson, <laughs> I'm sorry, and then the salesperson starts, uh, wanders off into his personal story. And I'm like, how does it have to do with what are we going to discuss? So the question would be, when, depending on the meeting, like when before agenda or after, should I tell a sales story, a personal story, should I start? And uh, how can I transition to it safely so that the person next to me wouldn't say, like, why is he doing that? You know, um, this is a, it's a really good question, Artyom. Um, we do typically introduce ourselves in business meetings, right? But we typically yeah. introduce just our job title and what we do, yeah. maybe in a sentence or two, right? So that is normal, right? That's normal. That's true. And, but what is not normal, unless you happen to be listening to very good salespeople, is to do this two minute introduction about ourselves. And it takes a little bit of courage to do it the first time. It's a little bit like learning how to pick the phone up and do a cold call. Like it seems like, it seems wrong. It, and, and, it, and it really does seem like, ooh, it's gonna sound like I'm wasting my time. So what, what I would ask your listeners to do is to just pick a business meeting where you're meeting someone for the first time, but it's not super important, you know, like this is not my top client. Maybe you're meeting, you know, someone down the organization a little bit and just try it and see what happens. 
And if, and if they don't lean in and smile and tell you their story and you don't exchange stories, then you can send me an email and tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'd okay, like you to yeah. try it, you know, because this takes a little bit of courage. It doesn't seem right. It seems wrong. It seems like I'm wasting their time. But here's the problem, you see. We know our story, and to us, it seems boring. But they never heard it before. To them, it's very interesting. They never heard your story. And they never heard anyone talk like that either. So it seems, you know, like in Russia, you will do this when you go to the bunya or whatever. After, you'll do all this story exchange, right? Yeah. If you, if you just try it at the beginning and just prepare to be amazed. Pre firstly, prepare for your meeting to go for two hours instead of one hour or 60 minutes, <laughs> 30 minutes, because you will find that you start swapping more stories. Usually when you start exchanging stories, you don't stop. So then you can put in your insight story and then you can say, how are things around here? And they will tell you stories about how things are in their business. You'll start getting stories back actually about their business as well, which is the best way to get it because if they just tell you facts about their business, which is how they would to answer a question. If I say, you know, how many engineers here? You know, they say 20. Okay, good. But if they tell you a story about, look, you know, we started with six guys, you know, and then we nearly went bankrupt and, and now we, then we started to hire and then we couldn't find any engineers. And, you know, now you're getting this story about how their team is built. You're going to remember that, right? And you're going to go back to your company. You're going to tell the story of this company and they're going to remember it. So this is how to really do a discovery meeting is by exchanging these stories because your job as a salesperson is to get their story. The story about how they can use your products and services in their business. So you have to get the story of their business to do that. But this point of exchanging stories is much more than exchanging personal stories. It's about exchanging business stories. And the personal story exchange just gets it started. It just gets you swapping stories, right? And then it just Great. goes the whole way through the thing. You know, man, I've just been sitting here telling stories the whole time. You, yeah. haven't, you haven't told me one story yet, Archim. I'm a bit bit disappointed in you. Man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got me there. Okay. <laughs> so you're you a know, young actually, guy. You're a young guy. So tell me, how did you get to be interviewing Mike Bosworth? You know, that's a pretty interesting story. Well, um, actually, that's that's kind of fine story because uh, I've recently uh enjoyed the time in, in storytelling because i got to it uh because i, I was a, i was a trainer i have i began as a trainer and there i first understood that storytelling is essential when i absolutely failed everything out of my first training because i was running uh, a great program i was i was all my best at the time i had two coffees inside of my stomach but it just didn't work and I, I'm, I'm like i'm going like hey guys a leader, a true leader can inspire and he influences the way people see things. And they're like, okay, okay, this is nothing new. And, and I'm like, uh, the cold sweat is running down my spine and I'm like, oh, okay, what can I do? And, and before, the, before the first coffee break, I actually felt like I'm troubled and I had a failure. But the, the thing is, this training was my first training in career. It was, I was 19 years old at the time. <laughs> and I was co-training with my, uh, my coach and my uh, chef, Elmira. And like, we are two different, different people. She is an analytical type of uh, person. She is great. She is amazing. She's smart. But she's not the charismatic type of person. Like, it's not bad. It's just the way it is. And she just sit, that sits there and tells cases about different people. Like, <laughs> just one case I would like to give you right now. Imagine a, a, a whole a set of shops around Moscow, uh, a wide, a wide range, and uh, there are two shops, and they evaluate the people inside the shops evaluate their um, reward and recognition package differently. Uh, in one shop, there's like seventy percent that are wow, this is great, and then in another shop, there are like thirty percent of those people. So the difference is really big. And we go into one shop, the, the one with uh, 30%, and they say, like, oh, we've got a phone, we've got parking lots, we've got medical insurance. The, the second guy's still, I want a phone, the parking lots, the insurance. And so they know same things, but they, they have different appreciation. 
and we start checking everything like transport and uh, area and stuff but we can't find anything and then like after a month we we hear somehow that the manager in the first shop was uh, transferred from a, a European company and he's he had like 14 points in his reward and recognition package and he had three right now so he's like walking around and blaming everything and like bleh, bleh, this is bleh. and the second guy came back from an army and if you were in russia you know what an army is, is like so he he gets got the phone a parking lot and he's like shining and he's spreading this so one thing one major thing we've changed is that we mix this communication with this one and the, the difference in the next year, it just, it just collapsed. So that was basically my experience with sort of storytelling. I, I understood that a trainer, a good trainer, is not someone who has knowledge. It's someone who has the knowledge to transfer knowledge. And this is story. Correct. And you know, and the, you know the second one, uh, the second guy uh, who you've, you've actually reminded me of, of him is Edward Stanock. Uh, he is the head of... Uh, Central and Eastern Europe in engaging leadership. She, he was like our plus three or plus four chef yeah. when I was working in that in Hewitt. And at the time, I was a lousy salesperson. I hated selling. I just, I don't like it still. But he just came in and uh, helped us with a large client. And we couldn't sell him anything. But he just came in and I'm like, okay, okay. Now in this meeting, I'm just going to look at him like straight in the, at him for an hour and I'm just going to jot down everything he says, like every technique, every spin and every smart and every, and I'm just like ready to write down. And in, in 15 minutes, the meeting goes so well that I have, I haven't ever got to this point with this client and I haven't got anything on my list. It's blank. So I cannot even differentiate. If, is it this question? Is it a type or, or I don't know, a formula? And then the, as the meeting went by, it was like 19 or I, I guess even two hours in, in length. We, we get to this client and the client actually buys this package, this lar largest package that we have. And I go after uh, say Edward after the meeting and say, like, what did you use? And he's just like, I, I just told them how we came to the idea of this product. And I'm just like, that's it? And he's like, yeah, well, that's it. And that's, then they, that's an inside story, by the way. And this was a nice, there was a, so, so much of an, an insight for me. And ever since I've been working in storytelling, and Mike Bosworth is just a small, small part because when I read the book, like Seven Stories, I get fascinated and I immediately write to the person and I'm just like, hey, I'm fascinated by your work. Let's do an interview. So that's how I get here. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good story. That's a Thank good story. You. And I have only one piece of coaching for your story. Oh, uh, great. Also for your listeners. And, and this is how you start your story. So it's very important to mention the time and place if you can remember to do yeah. it. Now, you that's said true. you were 19, so, and I get an idea how old you are by looking at you. But but if you can say, look, you know, uh, that was in Moscow, or even if you're dealing with a Russian audience, that was in uh, Kurskaya or whatever, um, um, it helps. What it does, it, it does several very important things. It lets them imagine themselves in that place at that time. Because what we want people to do when they're listening to our stories, we want them to imagine that they are the character in the story. This yeah. is where they get the experience. And if you don't tell them where and when it happened, it, it's harder. But there's another important thing. Whenever we say, you know, back in 2015, when I was working um, in Southern Moscow, that tells you it's a true story. Like that immediately says, you know, Artyom is going to say something true. But yeah. when started to tell me about there were two businesses and one had 70% and the other had 30% or whatever. This could be like a bit of a fairy tale. You know, this could be like, these are not real businesses, but this just like there were these two businesses, right? And that isn't in for business storytelling. That's not so good. It's much, yeah, better, that's true. It's much better to say, look, three years ago, we went in, we started to work with two companies. They were both mobile phone companies and one of them had, 70% retention of and the other 30 and we couldn't figure out why but it's but just by starting with the time and place yeah. 
I know it's a true story. It's not just a made up story. It's really important. It's much more important than you might think. It's, yeah. Well, thank you. I, I, yeah. I got a free coaching from my Yeah, yeah. Now. Well, also hope you like... listen because that's one of the <laughs> that's one of the more common mistakes in storytelling is not starting the right way. You know, um, to tell the truth, it, it's just I'm not protecting right now, but I usually start with the name and the date because <laughs> I'm allowed to say those things. But it's just. I, I don't. I don't actually know why I haven't mentioned them right now. But it's, that's that's an interesting question just to think about it. Yeah, so, yeah. Look, I catch myself also not obeying my own rules. <laughs> so, this is normal. That's true. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, this is really a major stuff, guys. This is this is great. Um, okay. So. Um, you know, uh, I've, I've talked about this technical stuff and uh, I would like to come back to the in-depth uh, things that you've mentioned. And uh, I know I have a conception why, why storytelling is even used in business. And it's yeah. not because of emotions. Could you just enlighten my audience uh, about this? Because I find it amazing. Yes. So when, because I'm an engineer, you know, and I have yeah. a history in software engineering. And so, so engineers... You know, when, when engineers ask, ask the question, why, they want an answer that explains why in detail, right? We want a, a mechanistic answer. And if you, if you read the books, in fact, if you read Mike Bosworth's book or Paul, Paul Smith's book or any book on storytelling, you will mm -hmm. get what I would call standard answers. The first one is, well, humans always told stories back from before we were writing. I'm going, good, doesn't tell me why. <laughs> tells, tells me tells me it probably worked in the past, but it doesn't tell me why, and it doesn't explain why I should do it today in business. And then they will say, well, storytelling it creates an emotional connection, and it's all about emotions. And they'll talk about the amygdala and the emotional brain and the rational brain. Yeah. And I can tell you, there is no rational brain. There is no rational brain in a human body. It's all emotion, and there is. It's the wrong way to think about how the brain works. It's not a modern way to think about how our brain works at all. And also, business meetings are kind of the least emotional things we do in our lives, actually. Most business meetings, you know, of course, we have occasionally people get angry or they're concerned or we see they're anxious or whatever. But generally, we hold our emotions pretty well in check. And it doesn't really explain why you should tell stories if it's something about emotions, because business meetings are kind of non-emotional. So I didn't like that answer very much. And then you look, and then, there's, then the explanations become not very satisfactory. So I, I had, before I got interested in teaching storytelling, I was already interested in neural networks and artificial intelligence and how our brain works, specifically the neocortex. So yeah. storytelling books, they want to talk about the amygdala and the emotion centers. And those are old parts of our brain, deep in near the brainstem, in the middle. But the biggest part of your brain, if you hold your two fists out in front of you, clenched, okay. that's, about, that's about how big your brain is. And if hmm. and in two halves, if you split it in two halves, and if you hold your fist flat, but imagine it bigger, like about the size of a dinner napkin, this is how big the neocortex is if you lay it flat. It's about two to three millimeters thick. It has six layers of neurons, about 30 billion of them. And it's like this big and it's all the same. All the cell structure is the same and you have all of your senses coming in, vision, hearing, smell, taste, motion, but also your internal body sense, your heart, your feeling of arousal, your heart rate, how much you're sweating, all of that internal feeling, we call it interoception, interoception, that also comes in and connects to the neocortex from the bottom. And what the neocortex is doing, and this is not well understood at all, is it's, it's detecting patterns in the environment. Anything that repeats as a pattern, it tries to predict what's going to happen next. Now, your brain was predicting I was going to say the word next. In fact, you were imagining me say the word next, but I left a gap there just so that you could kind of notice it. So you've got this brain, these two halves, and what it's doing is real-time predicting what you're going to see, what you're going to hear, what it's going to feel like, 
to touch, but also feel like in your body. So if I say something, my cortex is trying to predict how you will feel about what I say, what yeah. you might say next, how I will feel about that. We're running these continuous predictions. And here's the thing about storytelling. Stories, by definition, are unpredictable. A story has an unpredictable twist in it. The middle of a story is unpredictable. And whenever we can't predict easily, we pay attention. And this is the reason you should tell stories in business because when you tell a story, the listener wants to know what's going to happen next. What is going to be the next thing you say in this sequence? But if I tell you facts, people just stop listening. They're not interested in hearing facts. They just push back. But if I tell you a story, they listen. But better than that, they put themselves in the story and they experience it. So it's a, even a different kind of attention. It's a kind of attention where they're going to remember it because they experienced it, they felt it. So this is a much deeper explanation of why stories work. And every human has a neocortex, including CEOs and very high, <laughs> very high CFOs. And they all like to hear stories, as long as you're not wasting their time, as long as you're making a relevant business point. And you might say, well, how relevant is your personal story? Well, it's highly relevant because they don't know who you are and they want to know who you are. So it's relevant. When you're having a first meeting, it's relevant. And when you tell a success story about a client like them that succeeded in a way they hadn't heard of, it's relevant. And they listen, right? So as long as you're telling relevant stories, they will pay attention because they don't know what's going to happen next. They pay attention and they learn something new because they experience it from the story. So it is the most beautiful way to pass information that there is. And right. it's always going to be so. Our artificial intelligence is just going to learn how to tell stories. I can tell you that. It's going to learn how to tell stories and better ones. <laughs> but it's never going to be something that's smarter than us if it doesn't learn how to tell a story. Great. This is really inspiring because all the skills that go away with the technological and informational era. Uh, it's, it's good to hear that the human kind is the story kind would not Correct. go away. Correct. Great. Right. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Mike, um, we are actually a bit short because it's, it's really an amazing discussion here, but I would, I would like just to post two more questions go for me. us to discuss. Um, th those are typical questions that I ask everyone and I just want your point of view. So the first one is, uh, what would be your advice for someone who is just starting the storytelling career or learning storytelling, maybe in sales, what would be your advice from your expertise? Yeah, when I, the clients that I work with, um, we, do a, we help them to find a few stories, like the company story. You know, we, my advice is to get help to get started. But then uh -huh. we practice, and it's, you should consider storytelling as a practice. Like if you do karate, It's a practice. If you do yoga or whatever, if you like to play the guitar, it's a practice. And you need to practice your practice, right? So yeah. the best way to practice is in sales meetings. So instead of the boring forecast call and, you know, what's happening with this opportunity, let's share a story. If we have a monthly sales meeting, let someone have the job of telling the story from the last month meeting for a bit of repetition. And let someone else have the job of telling an interesting story from this one, maybe about a successful client or about some insight or even about something went wrong. Because when you get into this practice of sharing stories in your sales team, you'll get a lot of confidence to tell them with your clients. So you should consider it as something that you work up to. We don't, we don't just say like, I must tell a story and then go and practice on our most important client the first time because it might not go so well. You yeah. need multiple chances to tell the story so that you remember it well. And we use video message a lot for that. So if I say to my sales guys, okay, we just talked about the company story. I want you all to send me a video message. I just use WhatsApp, two minutes. And then I know they're going to practice because they'll do it and they'll see, all right, before they hit send, it's three minutes. So, okay, that's too long. So they'll do it again. And then they'll listen to themselves and they go, I don't like that. So they'll do it again. Before you know it, they've had 10 goes practicing, right? 
So this is really important. They get the chance to practice these stories. And then once you're comfortable with your first five, 10 stories, and then it, it clicks, right? And then you find it pretty easy to tell stories. So sure. treat it as a practice. Treat it, treat treat it, it as, as a practice. A practice that you need to practice. Great. That's a great advice. I'll put it down. Um, okay. And the, the last one would be, uh, for, imagine there is a phrase. Uh, it, it takes one thing to make a good story into a great story. And if there is one thing, that thing would be. So could you finish that phrase for me? Yeah. The, what, what differentiates a fantastic story from just an average story is that bit that Mike calls the complication. The, the bit in the middle where the listener cannot predict where it's going to go. And, the, and if one way is complete failure and the other way is complete success, this makes the best story. If the, child, yeah. if the child nearly died, but we saved them, these are the best stories, right? So it's this little unpredictable bit in the middle that makes the best stories. And we can feel it in our, in our hearts. Somewhere about here, we feel it, right? You tell that story and people go, whoa. You know, they feel it, right? Because it was so hard to predict. Our, what happens is we get in the story and we're hearing like this child might die and we're thinking of all the terrible things that would happen, all the possibilities, could we save them, right? Bang, we tell. I'll give you the shortest story from my book, which, is, which yeah. really, really illustrates this point. So this is, um, I don't even know if this is a true story, to be honest, but it's said that Ernest Hemingway, the... Um, the famous American writer, author, once had a bet for ten dollars that he could tell a story in six words. Yeah. And this and this is the story. The story is baby shoes for sale, never worn. Great. Now he's That's not actually horrible. a story. He's not actually a story. It's just the middle part of the story. And we can't predict how it ends, but it makes our minds did that baby die? Uh, did the people, did the parents buy some shoes and, and uh, had an, uh, a miscarriage or what, why, you know, we, and we don't know why, right? Because the story didn't end. So it's not, yeah. a, it's actually not a complete story. There was no setting. You, you weren't told the setting. You weren't told the resolution. So it's actually that, it's actually that middle bit that I told you about. And it makes your mind go everywhere. And it's powerful. So he's actually the heart of the story is unpredictability. Thank you. This is great. This is, I'll, I'll just put it in my uh, agenda for explaining <laughs> the greatness of the story. Thank you. Mike, thank you so much for your time. This was really insightful for my audience and for me, of course, because I got the free coaching. So um, I... I'm so grateful. Uh, um, could you just give me some contacts of yours so that the people are, that are watching could reach yeah, you? Yeah, the, the, the easiest way to find me is to put Mike, Mike Adams storytelling into Google and you will get like <laughs> 10 pages of the book and my website and all of that. It's, uh, your audience is smart enough to run Google and put three words in. I think they, yeah, will, okay. they will find me, right? <laughs> and the book okay. is available. The book is still on sale as an ebook so it's two dollars 99 us so what is that in rubles roughly these days um, um it's about uh one one play it's it's uh, one one dollar is about 60 rubles i guess yeah right yeah. so it's not too expensive um yeah and that's a, that's by far the easiest way to get it in russia or the audiobook which which i narrated and mike bosworth narrated the forward and even some of the people who tell stories narrated into the audiobook as well which is interesting yeah and, great. Um, great trick. Yeah. So look, uh, just put those words, Mike Adams storytelling. You'll find me. And okay. uh, yeah. And look, I I really wish your um, your Russian audience success because it's a fantastic country, Russia. You know, this is what I got to learn. You know, most people outside of Russia have a very poor opinion, but I got two years of meeting some wonderful people, and um, I like the way that business is done. I obviously, I don't like the corruption, but I think like the the way that people relate to each other and the way that business is done, it's it's good, you know. And uh, you guys have 
no reason but not for your country to go much better. You know, that's, that's what I think. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, I wish you all the great stories to come. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.